So the next um, species interaction is predation. Obviously, this interaction is between predator and prey. And so when we look at predator-prey relationships, obviously one is benefiting and one is harmed, hence the positive and the negative symbols up there at the top. One benefits, one doesn't. And so in predator-prey relationships, um, you can actually graph these over time and you can see how the interactions between um, two different species, how their population sizes will fluctuate depend depending on the predator population or the prey population and their sizes. And we'll talk about more of that in class with graphs and data. Um, and so prey have evolved certain defensive adaptations to help protect themselves against predators. Now you could probably brainstorm some ideas um, off the top of your head because it's kind of like common sense at this point in your life. Uh, but one of them would be camouflage. So when we talk about camouflage here though, we're gonna call it cryptic coloration. So you can see this moth here is um, pretty well camouflaged, looks like a leaf. Um, here you have a fish living under the ocean that blends in with the rocks or coral that's there. Um, now the opposite of this, instead of camouflage, some species have evolved bright warning colors, a posmatic coloration. And in this, this is like a warning symbol to the predator. Hey, guess what? Here I am, but I'm poisonous, so whatever. And so bright warnings um, have evolved as well to help them stand out and help the predator make decisions. So here's a picture I took in Belize, and um, at first glance, you might just think it's stuff on a, uh, like on bark on a tree, but these are actually bats hanging out in the middle of the day. Uh, here's another picture I took in Belize from a little boat. Um, in this picture, you can see a crocodile hanging out on that log in the background. And so when we look at um, the two types of coloration, you have both cryptic and aposmatic, and if you could please summarize them in your box six. Now, uh, other ones would be mimicry, like um, my two boys, a lot of times it's like, hey, stop repeating me, where one like repeats the other one, they're mimicking each other. And so um, you have beta sin mimicry and malarian mimicry. And in one of them, these two butterflies here, upon first glance, you don't really notice any differences, except for when you look a little bit more closely, you see that this one has black spots on its wings. And so these are two different species of butterflies. One is poisonous, one isn't. But if you are a predator, a bird who eats butterflies, as soon as you're flying by and you see orange and black butterfly, you think it's food. Um, I'm sorry, if you're looking to hunt butterflies, you would think, oh look, there's food, but oh wait, it's orange and black, it's a monarch butterfly, I'm not gonna eat it. Well, this butterfly species right here is not poisonous. However, predators don't know that because it's evolved to look very similar and mimic the poisonous monarch butterfly. Um, <clears throat> and so when we look at uh, other examples, so here you see a snake, or what you think is a snake, and in reality, um, this is a caterpillar. And the caterpillar actually puffs up to mimic what a snake looks like. And so here, I believe the top picture is of the snake and the bottom picture, oh, maybe it's all a caterpillar. Um, anyway, so it mimics a snake and so that is one way um, it helps or it's evolved to avoid being uh, eaten by predators. Okay. So in Eulerian mimicry, um, we as people have grown up knowing that if you see an insect that has black and yellow stripes, you're gonna avoid it, whether it's a wasp or a honeybee, um, that's all I got. <laughs> a wasp or a honeybee. Sometimes there's moths that have evolved to have black and yellow stripes. There's even flies that have black and yellow stripes. And so quite a few species have evolved to have this common black and yellow pattern. So now um, predators have learned to um, uh, avoid black and yellow. So I think of Mullerian mimicry as kind of like group defense. Um, it's uh, easier for predators to learn, oh, I got stung by something black and yellow. I'm going to avoid all things black and yellow. Okay, so in Eulerian mimicry, it's when two or more unpalatable, unpalatable means doesn't taste good, um, uh, species resemble each other. Whereas in Betasin mimicry, it's when a harmless or um, palatable species mimics a harmful or unpalatable species. Okay, and that can go in your box seven. 
Uh, another interaction between species is herbivory. So here you have um, herbivores eating plants. So uh, the difference between plants and prey is that plants can't escape. Um, and so uh, they've evolved certain defenses like spines, um, or thorns, hot, like the Caspian peppers, or really spicy um, uh, or poisonous even. So um, plants have evolved different um, protective strategies, defenses against herbivores. All right. Um, okay. Now, ooh, there's another type of interaction called symbiosis. Now, symbiosis is when you have a close interaction between two different species. Um, their livelihoods are kind of are, are very close, I guess. And so there's three types of symbiosis or living closely together. You have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. So in mutualism, it's when both species living closely together benefit from the relationship. So flowers benefit from bees or pollinators because their sperm gets spread, whereas the insect benefits because it gets nectar or food. Um, so here's a bee covered in pollen, and those pollen is just plant sperm that's going to get spread, and the flowers will be fertilized. This is a win-win re relationship in nature. Um, and then we have here in symbiosis, I'm sorry, commensalism, is where one benefits and one's neither harmed nor helped. So on a whale, um, there's barnacles that attach themselves to the body of the whale, and that humpback whale isn't harmed by a barnacle attaching to its skin, but that barnacle benefits because as the whale like swims through the ocean, you have water going past the whale bringing nutrients and dissolved oxygen. And so the barnacle benefits from a constant stream of water um, passing through its body. Um, here's a tree that has another type of plant called a bryophyte um, living on top of its branch. Now the big tree itself, it's Leaves can still do photosynthesis. Its roots can still get nutrients from the soil. It's not harmed nor helped by this other plant, this bryophyte, living on its branch. Well, the, the bryophyte living there has a place to attach, a place to grow. When it rains and the water, like, runs down the bark of the tree, its roots get water. And so it actually, um, one benefits and one's neutral. And then, of course, we have parasitism, where one benefits and one's harmed. And so, uh, like a tick here is um, uh, going to benefit from sucking blood from an organism, uh, or a mosquito, is a parasite. And so, uh, here's a picture I took when I was in Belize, I believe, and this is a strangler fig. So, the tree underneath, um, right here, this tree is the normal tree that's growing. And then, oops, well, let's see, sorry. Uh, this tree here is the normal one and then this that you see is actually a vine or another plant the strangler fig growing around it and it's basically going to like suffocate um, the tree inside and uh, eventually killing the tree I, I don't think suffocates really the right word but somehow it kills the tree it's wrapping around and then takes its place so that's an example of parasites between two different plant species which i think is super cool okay um all right, so uh, in general, what is the meaning of symbiosis? Um, and then you can kind of think about the three different kinds. And maybe you provide examples, and that goes in your box eight. And so now we're going to make a new set of boxes, but there's only five for the new set. Okay, so facilitation, um, when you think of the word facilitate, that means to help. So in facilitation, this is different than mutualism or commensalism. Because the species that has positive effects on um, others nearby, it's not necessarily a close interaction. Um, it's, uh, when you look at the definition here, um, has a positive effect on the survival and reproduction of other species without necessarily living in direct and intimate contact of like symbiosis. So here you have what's called a salt marsh. And there's a certain species of plants that lives here. And this plant makes the soil more hospitable for other plant species. It helps prevent salt buildup and then it also creates shade um, and reduces evaporation. 
So this one species presence in the salt marsh is going to help the other plant species living. So it's not a mutualistic relationship, one or commensalistic relationship, um, but its presence helps the ecosystem and the um, plant communities living there. So that's an example of facilitation. Um, when you remove this plant species, you actually find a 50% less plant species in that area of the marsh. So it has a positive environmental um, modifications um, in that ecosystem. Okay, so facilitation is in box one. Ooh, and so now we get to look at how biological communities differ in both their diversity as well as their trophic structure. So when we look at species diversity, there's two ways that we can um, classify this or uh, break it down. So you have species richness is one measure of the species diversity or how many different kinds of species there are, as well as the relative abundance. So when we look at species richness, it's as simple as the number of different species in a community. Whereas a relative abundance is the proportion of each species um, uh, and how it represents all individuals in the community. So let's look at two communities, community A and community B. Here you can see, oh, look at all those pretty trees. Um, we have the same species of trees in community B, but right away looking at them, you do notice a slight difference. So if we were to talk about species diversity in community A and community B, um, species richness, there's four species in A. Hey, but there's also four species in community B. But when we talk about relative abundance, what we see is that um, each of these plant species is evenly distributed. Roughly a quarter or 25% of that forest is each type of tree listed or shown here. Well, if I look at community B and I count up the different species, I find that this tree only makes up 10% of, of the community. This one, there's only one out of 20, so about 5%. Whereas the majority of the plants are the tree species in community B is this oak looking tree. And you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, let's pretend that there's an invasive species. Um, this is a real uh, issue happening in our forests across California. It's called um, the bark beetle, and it's an invasive species, meaning it's not native to here, and it gets inside the trees and it eats the bark from the inside out, causing the trees to die. Now, this is a problem because not only do you have dead trees, but that increases the chance of forest fire. So let's pretend this bark beetle, though, only infects certain species of plants. So if it were to infect community A, um, and uh, or let's pretend it's this oak, I don't even know if it's oak, but this type of tree right here is the one that the beetle is going to infect. You can see how in community A, there's enough um, diversity, but also like relative abundance, like good proportion of the different species, where it's a little bit more stable of a community. Whereas community B, if the majority was that one species and that one species gets wiped out, well, now you have uh, quite drastic effects and, and negative consequences for that community B. So when you talk about species diversity, the species richness matters. The more numbers of species, the better. But their relative abundance is also important for the, the community's stability in case of different disturbances, whether it's um, floods, fires, disease, humans. Um, the greater the relative abundance, for each of those different species, the better. Um, so like here's my husband when we were in Costa Rica years ago. And so you can see that the uh, quite a bit of um, species diversity, all the different kinds of plants. Um, this is enormous amounts of biological diversity. Versus here's my husband in Alaska. You see basically one type of tree in the forest. So in this forest in, in Costa Rica, if you had a plant affect one species, there's so much diversity, it's probably going to survive and be okay. Um, whereas in Alaska, let's pretend that bark beetle comes and infects these conifers, these pine trees. Well, then you're going to have um, kind of devastating consequences. Uh, here's a chaparral ecosystem. Not too much biological diversity. Uh, and then here's Miss Mueller and uh, me in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Again, because of the... Uh, abiotic, the temperature and the rocky soil, not much biological diversity going on. And so the rainforest 
has the highest amount. So um, go ahead and summarize species diversity in box two.